Bingo. 12 o'clock, whoops, 1 o'clock rock here on Think Tech. Research in Manoa every Monday. And today we have uh, Margaret McFall Nagai. I pronounced that right? Nye. Nye. Mm -hmm. Okay, she's the professor and director of PBRC. And that stands for Pacific uh, Research, um, wait, Bioscience Research Center, which is part of SOEST, okay, the School of Ocean, Earth Science, and Technology. And her husband, Ned Ruby who is a professor also at PBRC, am I right? That's correct. Welcome to the show, you guys. Thank you, Jay, for having us. So fun to have you, no kidding. I'm so glad you're here. Mm -hmm. And so we're calling this show, Bacteria Can Be Your Best Friend. And that's, and that's, um, that's the message we want to leave. Bacteria, bacteria can be your best friend. Bacteria can be your best <laughs> friend. <laughs> what does that mean? Well, I think one of the things that uh, we've begun to learn um, not only as scientists, but uh, the public in general, is that bacteria aren't only problems. And uh, unfortunately, for the last 100 years, we've mostly thought about bacteria as being problems. That's when they uh, cause problems, and we notice we have bacteria associated with us. But we have bacteria associated with us all the time. Uh, and those are mostly good bacteria. And it's just like uh, your car. Whenever it's running fine, you don't ever look under the hood. Uh, and, uh, but that's exactly what our bacteria are doing. They're helping run our engine. Why does it remind me of the whale and the lanternfish? The lanternfish attaches itself to the whale and helps the whale. That's symbiosis. That's yeah. symbiosis. Mm -hmm. Sure. And then, you know, guys from UH have been telling me, at least for a little while, that in my gut there is a biome, mm -hmm. and the biome is, is these bacteria that, I, that, my, that our species has been carrying around for as long as we've been a species, and they help us in so many ways, and we could not live without them, and they're bacteria. That's right, that's so right. I have come to feel they are my friends, hence the title. They are your friends. I feel them now. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> hundreds, of, hun diff hundreds of different species of bacteria associate with you, and you know, by last count, there were only a few uh, dozen pathogens, bacterial pathogens, uh, and it's, it's one of those things that we focused on pathogens because we tend to focus on war. Um, but, uh, <laughs> you know, um, it's, they make us healthy. And actually, there was a time where we couldn't, most of them are not culturable in the laboratory. So we couldn't know who they were and what they were doing. So because of that, um, it, we've just been enabled to do that in the last, oh, I'd say, oh, it started about 30 years ago, but really, you know, cheaply and and, and cheap and fast uh, sequencing has only been around for about a dozen years. And so uh, that has opened up the world uh, for us to be able to describe the microbes that we have and determine whether or not they're stable and follow an individual through their life and that sort of thing. It's pretty amazing. I, I imagine you know, if we took a microscope and kept on you know, looking closer and closer and closer to one of these um, bacteria, it would, we ultimately find it with a smiley face. <laughs> a smiley face. <laughs> Probably would. <laughs> yeah. Is it just in my gut or a whole body? Well, it's across, uh, yeah, almost all of your surfaces. And um, most of the uh, organ systems that you have are associated with bacteria, most of the, the human organ systems. And everything we say about humans, we also should should make sure is clear is also true of other animals and, and plants. It's pretty much every living thing has decided to set up associations with uh, these little microorganisms which are capable of doing so many things that we can't do and together they can help us um, not only be healthy but develop well and, and do some pretty amazing things. Um, and that's uh, the, import the important aspect of re recognizing that they're our friends. Yeah, that's re it's really amazing to think about it that way. This is a new science, isn't it? This hasn't, we haven't come to this conclusion until fairly recently. No? Yeah, that's, that's very true. And Ned, Ned and I uh, were both in this field, um, you know, in the 80s and 90s when um, it was thought to be, a symbiotic association with animals was thought to be fairly rare. And so uh, the animals live in the hydrothermal vents. Many people have heard of those and they have um, microbes, bacteria that allow them to live on chemical energy. And then we were studying luminous bacteria, uh, which 
live with animals. And these were very conspicuous uh, symbioses. And um, we thought, it had been thought, that the microbes that live with humans just come in and they called them by a, by a name that we now know is inappropriate called commensal. And commensal by definition means that they live there and they don't do anything, really. Um, they don't harm us, they don't help us. Mm -hmm. But now we know, we're able to know who they are and to know that they're stable and that, uh, yeah, and that they're, they're absolutely essential for our health. So if it's symbiosis, um, then that means that the deal goes two ways. It's a win-win exactly. deal. Well, symbiosis means has no fitness. In, in other words, it doesn't say whether or not it's harmful or not harmful, that word. Uh, in fact, there are three kinds of symbiosis. There's pathogenesis, which is win-lose, uh, and then there's commensalism, which is no effect and, and win on the part of the bacteria. And then there's um, uh, mutualism, which is win-win. Yeah, so there are three different kinds of symbiosis an umbrella term. So the, the ones in my gut with the smiley faces, mm -hmm. um, they're helping me. They're helping right. me digest whatever the chemical process, we'll get into that. Mm -hmm. But I'm also helping them. Right. Am I helping them keep alive? Is that what it is? Are they getting nutrients from my system that keep them alive? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in fact, uh, um, our bodies are, are, are a pretty wonderful place from a bacterium's point of view because what bacteria like are constant conditions. Uh, they don't like to have to keep changing. Um, you know, it gets dry, it gets hot, it gets cold, it gets wet. They, have, they, can, they can survive that, but every time that change happens, they've got to retool to be able to live in that environment. You get into your gut tract or even in, in, your, um, in your respiratory system, and it's a constant 37 degrees centigrade. It's moist. Uh, there are nutrients coming three times a day into your gut tract. Perfect. Right on, right on cue. Yeah, what, what more could you want? That's right? why the smiley face. Yeah, they're smiling. <laughs> <laughs> as long as we do the right thing, we give them the right food, uh, they also, you know, their health is also affected by the food that we eat, just as our, our health is. Yeah. And, um, and the two things are connected. Just a, 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 just a thought, a thought here is that do they help us beat off bad bacteria? Do they help us um, beat off disease? Uh, and if they don't, could we change them? Could we modify them to have them help us? Well, Well, so let's see. Um, the answer to your first question is yes, they do, they do indeed um, help us. There's a, uh, there's a, uh, uh, one very simple approach, uh, very simple thing, which is an exclusion. In other words, if they're living in a in a particular area of your body, it's very hard for bad bacteria to get a hold, foothold. It's like everybody's already living in all the houses. There's no room for a new one to come, a uh, new person to come in. So that's the same thing. And that sort of exclusion is really um, just a very important and sort of passive way. But there's also very positive ways in which the bacteria. Are, creating environments where um, pathogens don't grow. One of the uh, sort of simplest one is on your skin. Uh, there are bacteria that use the um, uh, sort of the oils that come out of your skin and they turn them into acids. And so the, your surface of your skin is, is acidic. And most pathogens don't like acidic. They like very neutral conditions. And so that right there is one simple way in which the bacteria, we're feeding bacteria so that they can acidify our skin so that the bad guys can't get there. And what, I, one of the really important things is though to keep the community, the healthy community in balance. And if you do something like take antibiotics and you throw the community out of balance, um, one of the microbes within the community can become dominant and, and create all kinds of problems. And the classic one at this point is Clostridium difficile or C. diff. If you get go into the hospital and you take an antibiotic and you, you, you're a carrier of C. diff and about 19% of all people are carriers of C. diff. And it, when it's in balance, it actually some, there, is, there are some studies to show that when it's in balance, it's actually a good thing to have. Uh, but if you take antibiotics and it gets out of balance, it, you know, you can get very, very, very sick, and, and some people have, have died from C. diff mm, infection. Mm. So <clears throat> I guess that raises the question of can I tune my biome? Can I put, can I put those acid ones on my skin? Can I put uh, a, a, a better balance of uh, bacteria in my gut? Can I take a little pill? 
you know, can I? Well, there's no my... question you can you can do that for your gut track. Um, normally, what what you do is not so much uh, as Margaret said. If you've already got um, a lot of diversity in your in your microbiome and in, in your gut track or elsewhere on your body, then what you need to do is just nurture those those things that are there all right. Sort of like a garden. Um, you you can by adding the right things that cause one of these bacteria or one group of these bacteria to come up and be healthier than, than you're actually creating a nurturing situation. One of the things that you can do um, diet-wise uh, to help your gut tract bacteria that, that many people know about is the complex carbohydrates, not simple sugars. Uh, another thing is to re eat a diversity of plant materials, lots of different kinds of plant uh, fruits and vegetables, et cetera. Those things have both been shown to help create a more diverse um, group of bacteria in your gut tract simply because you're providing foods that each of a number of different ones like to have. And one of, one of the interesting things... I love this conversation. Well, one of the, <laughs> one of the interesting things they found recently, speaking about diversity, um, uh, Maria Domingos Bello at uh, uh, New York University has done a series of studies on on, on cultures, the Amerindians and people in Malawi and, and so on. And it turns out that people in the industrialized nations um, in Europe and the United States, Canada, Australia, and so on, have less diverse, less diversity. And the Amerindians are extreme, have extremely diverse. Um, diverse in what way? Uh, they have lots of different, many more species. Okay. Many more species okay. of bacteria associated with them. And uh, they, by and large, are healthier and more resilient. Uh, ah, okay, can yeah. you can we write that down? <laughs> the more diverse your yeah. biome, the healthier you are. That's right. Yeah. And you can make it more diverse by eating what? Diverse foods? Correct. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's, and there's lots of great studies on that. Um, and that, as Margaret had said before, that's, these studies have been enabled in the last 10 years by um, you know, inexpensive identification methods, which are primarily due to uh, sequencing of uh, the genome, sequencing of genes that, that are, that tell you what the bacteria are that you have within you. Mm -hmm. So is it, is it fair to say, you know, sort of like nobody's fingerprints are exactly the same, mm -hmm. nobody's eyes are exactly the same, mm -hmm. nobody's biome is exactly the same, can I say that? Yes, you it's can. Every, everybody has a, a, its own fingerprint of bio, biome, yeah. yeah. In, yeah. in fact, uh, you can trace the movement of somebody. You can, you could, if you had a series of, of um, keyboards, you would be able to tell whose keyboard is whose <laughs> by swiping them and looking at the bacteria that they left behind. Now, can I change my biome? Now, I read somewhere about a little pill that's based on somebody else's biome. Uh, yes. uh, I don't want to talk about the mechanics of how that pill got made. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> but you can take this little pill, and now you can, you can have the other person's biome. It may be a better biome than your biome for one. Yeah. Is this true? Yeah. Or it might even be your biome that you're re-instilling in yourself. As Margaret said, if you, if you have to take antibiotics, of course you take them. But if, uh, that will have a, a detrimental effect, uh, sort of like clearing your, clearing your, your, your lawn out. Uh, you, there's a chance that weeds will come in. And so what you want to do is you want to save back some of the things that you, were in your garden and then bring them in as quickly as possible and plant them again. And that's what these, uh, these transplants basically are. Uh, these bacterial transplants are, are uh, seeds that can now go into an, an area that may have been wiped out completely and make sure that the right things begin to grow in there. So you can actually not only save your own seeds, but you can save and improve your own seeds. Mm -hmm. And so when you, when you reintroduce your own seeds as modified, you may have a better garden than you had before. Possible? I'm not sure we're at that I'm, stage I'm yet. taking you right to the envelope here. <laughs> well, so, yes, yeah, so, I mean, this, this is a, you know, Jay, it's a brand new world in the last 10 years. And this, these are the sorts of things that um, the biomedical community is asking. You know, they're trying to figure out, you know, how are we going to harness this and, and help people uh, be as healthy as they possibly can. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I feel it. I feel it. I feel now my biome is telling me we, we have to take a break. <laughs> okay. They know best. <laughs> <laughs> Always listen. That's Margaret McFall Nye and Ned Ruby. 
uh, doing uh, bio, uh, Pacific Bioscience Research. We'll be right back. Aloha, I'm Kawe Lucas, host of Hawaii is my mainland here on Think Tech Hawaii every Friday at 3 p.m. We address issues of importance for those of us who live here on the most isolated landmass on the planet. Please come join me Fridays at 3 p.m. Mahalo. Aloha, my name is Josh Green. I'm a senator from the Big Island. I work in the ER there. But on Tuesday afternoons, I get to come and spend 45 minutes to an hour with Jay Fidel and the Think Tech staff. They're terrific professionals. They help us to bring some of the leading cutting edge topics here across our state to you. So you can join us at our show on healthcare in Hawaii to talk with leaders from across all the spectrum of health in our state. Or you can join us for any other show where we talk about economic development or tourism or some really eclectic programs too. So really, we'd love to see you here on our show. Thanks for joining us, and thanks for supporting us. <laughs> I wish I did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Part of the okay, we're back. We're back with Margaret and Ned. We're talking about bioscience. We're talking about, you know, we, we, I got my, all my curiosity questions out in yeah. the first segment of the show, but now we should really find out what you guys do. <laughs> What do you do every day? What are you studying every day? What are you teaching so, about? So something that biologists have done throughout history is when there is a very complex process. Um, an example is developmental biology. You go from an egg to a, to a whole um, human being. Very, very, very complex process. But there are some uh, animals that, that are small and simple and do things in such a way that you can determine how one cell, the fate of one cell, why a cell becomes a particular type of cell during the developmental process. So in developmental biology, for instance, um, uh, it's been very, very successful to use what they call model systems. And so most of our bacteria associate with the apical surfaces of our epithelia. Or in, in other words, they just sit on top of the surfaces of our skin and our gut and whatnot. <clears throat> and so um, what Ned and I did was we looked for a model in which uh, that was very, very simple. And there's, uh, what we do is we study uh, an animal, a Hawaiian animal here, a uh, small squid called Euprimnoscolopes, the Hawaiian bobtail squid. And it has a symbiosis with a luminous bacteria in Vibrio fisheri. So Vibrio fisheri is in large numbers in the squid, but it's just one type of bacterium, unlike us where we have hundreds of types of bacteria. And so we, when we have one type of bacterium, we can hope uh, to decipher the conversation that the host has with its symbiotic partner. It makes the research easier. Yep. It makes the research very, very much clearer. Um, when I'm talking to audiences, I often ask people if they've seen My Dinner with Andre, which was a movie in which two people talk to one another. And you could really drop we into... We do that here a lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can drop into that conversation. You can drop into this conversation very easily. Whereas right. if it's some huge cocktail party, you know, trying to understand what everybody's doing and yeah. saying... Different and, animal. Yeah, mm -hmm. very hard. So that's why we... So we study this small bobtail squid, and I study mainly the host side of the symbiosis, and Ned's lab studies mainly the bacterial Perfect side. Perfect for a husband-wife yeah. combination. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, um, as I recall, this squid, has, the, the, the bacteria helps the squid see. Actually, no. Oh. Um, what it is, is that the bacteria are in an organ that's sort of in the middle, middle of the body cavity of the animal. And the animal is a night active predator. It comes out onto the shallow reefs and it hangs in the water column. And it emits ventral light, it emits light out of its bottom surface that matches moonlight and starlight. So if it goes over the visual field of a predator sitting on the bottom and looking up, it doesn't cast a shadow because it's matching the moonlight and starlight. So it's like a stealth it's a defense, uh, defense. Uh, it's a camouflage. Camouflage mechanism. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. But there are many um, other marine creatures that have adapted the same kind of association with light emitting bacteria uh, to create little spotlights or to create lures mm -hmm. uh, to lure other organisms over because of the uh, because of the light so basically anim the, you know, animals have have learned that if you have the ability to make light there are many ways that you can use that in different behaviors mm -hmm. uh, the one we the one we look at uh, while we don't look at the behavior very much 
it turns out that behavior is is a more of a defensive one than a um, than shall we say a, a, a an attracting one yeah. or a, or a vision one. Well, you know what? I think you know we we were raised to think that through Mendelian um, Mendelian process that humankind was developed by a series of mutations. Mm -hmm. And if you had a beneficial mutation, you would survive. And if you didn't, well, maybe you wouldn't survive. And mm -hmm. ultimately, here we are together, mm -hmm. part of a successful species. Right. But I, th I think what people don't realize is that while we were doing that, all these other creatures in the world were doing that. What a complicated thing. God would have had to be really busy on that. <laughs> <laughs> Working all of these species, mil really like millions, hundreds of thousands of species on this planet, all doing that mutational thing, all surviving or dying as the case may be, even the little squid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the, <laughs> what, what's interesting, too, is that the bacteria have yet another thing that they do, and that is that they, uh, some of their phenotypic traits or some of the things that, that their adaptations, they just take DNA up from other bacteria um, in something called lateral gene transfer, which is much more rare in animals and plants, but bacteria do it quite quite readily. And so is that, that, is that nasty? Or, uh, or is no, that not a necessarily. Friend, friendly transfer? It can be. It can be uh, both. They can transfer something called a pathogenicity island that will render something that had been harmless harmful, and then at the same time they can they can transfer something that uh, will allow that bacterium to be a good symbiote. How do you study this in terms of instruments? How, you, how do you find this stuff out? Do you have to look through a microscope? Do you, what do you, do you have tests that you, what do you do? So um, a number of things, of course. Uh, our, our major uh, uh, experimental approach is uh, one that this model system has allowed us to develop and is one reason why we work with that. And that is uh, the animal, when it lays eggs and the eggs hatch, uh, the eggs are coming out bacteria free, just like infants do when, they, when, they're, where, when they're born. Uh, so because they come out bacteria free, we can introduce whatever or, or, or present whatever bacterial types we want to to that animal and say, okay, how are you going to communicate with those? Is that a bacterium that you're willing to live with? Is it one that's willing to live with you? And because the bacteria can be genetically manipulated very easily in the lab, like, like, uh, like other bacteria, uh, like E. coli, uh, that many people have worked with, we can make changes in the genome of the bacterium and then present it to the animal and say, okay, is that something, is that change a good change or a bad change? And that's one of our sort of major uh, approaches or paradigms is that we look at the initiation of this communication um, once, the back, once the animal hatches and is presented with bacteria. Or what does the animal do if we don't give it any bacteria? How does it live in the absence of the bacteria? Yeah, I mean, the classic one that Ned's lab has, has done is to make mutations so that the bacteria don't make light. In other words, they don't do their job. And if you introduce that to the animal, the animal will take them in for a little while, and then it says, wait, you're not doing your job. You're gone. And it gets rid of those bacteria that are Kills them? It, it, we did, we're not exactly sure how it does, but when you look, you, you try to find them in the light organ later on, you can't. It eliminates them, it eliminates either by, them. Either by e e expelling them and not letting them grow back up, or uh, and perhaps by killing them. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, they're able to tell. How does it know? <laughs> it's a good question. How does it know? This is deeply within the, the host animal's DNA to yeah. know that the host is he that the the bacteria is helping or not. Well, one of one of the things that we found that's that I think is is quite cool is that the light organ um, is despite well, so the light organ is very much like the eye in many 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 ways, and so uh, the eye is photoreceptive tissue, of course, the retina receives light from the environment. Um, in the animal, in, excuse me, in the light organ, the bacteria make light, but all the surrounding tissues are very similar. So they have a lens, and they have um, a tapetum analog, and they have a choroid, and they have an iris, and so on. So they, it's very eye-like. Well, that even goes more deeply into the biochemistry. So the same molecule that receives light uh, in, in the 
in the visual system is a rhodopsin. It's called rhodopsin. And that uh, allows you to see. Um, there is also rhodopsin, the same type of rhodopsin, in the light organ. And it allow, seems, may be involved um, in allowing the animal to see the, the light that the bacteria is making. So Margaret yes. wrote an article about that. It was called The Inner Eye. <laughs> Um, yeah. yeah, so that, so that, because you're absolutely right. How do you tell what's going on inside of you? Well, you need a little light sensitive tissue down there that says they're making the light, feed them, <laughs> leave them alone, or they're not doing their job. Yeah. <clears throat> you guys must want to live a thousand years so you can answer all these questions. <laughs> Maybe 10,000, you know. Well, you know, the funny thing was we thought it would be, there's only one host and one microbe. You know, how complicated can it be? We thought it would be pretty simple. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. yeah, we thought we were going to be done with this long ago. <laughs> and it just well, keeps opening up. <laughs> how does that cell know so much? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, well, it's you know, <clears throat> I had my questions, and now we have some questions. We have other questions that were sent okay. to me. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, it uh, came from uh, Rena Lefebvre at, uh, I guess she's at SoWest, mm -hmm. but I don't know where she got them from. So okay. let's treat this as a, a short examination of the two of you. You're in school now. Okay. Excellent. Okay. <clears throat> Question one. How are environmentally rare bacteria harvested from the host's habitat during the onset of a horizontally transmitted symbiosis? I like this question. If this is a so, non-incomprehensible yeah. question that we'll, we'll no, discard. No, I, I understand it. So, so it turns out, particularly in the ocean, it's not uncommon to have animals that have very large populations of a given bacterium, but you can't find those bacteria in the surrounding seawater, or they're very low in, in number. So um, in the case of our symbiosis, there you can find Vibrio fisheri, the symbiont, the luminous bacteria in the surrounding seawater. And when the baby hatches, the little baby squid, it has a very different uh, light organ than the adult light organ. On the surface of the light organ, it has these little hairs called cilia, and those cilia um, are involved in capturing bacteria. And it's the, the behavior of the cilia, it's sort of biophysical as well as biochemical. And so Vibrio fisheri attaches to the cilia and then sends um, signals to the animal. And that causes the animal to upregulate genes that, that are then the products of which are then are poured into the, envi the environment surrounding the bacteria. And we think that's how um, the bacteria become exclusive on the surface. The, the, the partner, the luminous bacteria become uh, exclusive on the surface because they only represent about 0.1% of all the bacteria plankton. So the animal has to winnow them away from everything else. So. Yeah. Do that. Yeah, yeah. It's it's bio it's biophysical and biochemical is what we found so far. Yeah. And in the absence of Vibrio fisheri, nothing gets in the light organ. So it there it's a very special spy versus by you know lock and key thing. And there are there are many many keys to getting into the inside. Yeah, but these keys will all teach us right. about, about a human process that parallels. Yeah. yeah, they already already have some of the keys. Are, are actually compounds that we knew about in the past, and this is work from Margaret's lab, uh, that we knew about in the past because they were produced by pathogenic or, or disease-causing bacteria. Um, and because they, they create reactions by animal cells. And it turns out that uh, what has probably happened is these were developed as signal molecules by beneficial bacteria because uh, you've got to get somebody's attention to talk to them, right? So you need, you need to perturb them a little bit. You need to tap them on the shoulder. Um, but the pathogens uh, have taken that same <laughs> compound and said, well, if I can tap somebody on the shoulder, I can, I can really hit them. I can maybe hit them really hard if I just make 10 times as much as is supposed to be made to have a little message. And now it become, goes from being a signal compound to being a toxin. And so now you're creating a toxic compound. And we, this, some of these signals were first discovered as toxins. And then Margaret discovered that they were uh, present as part of the conversation in the bacterium host interaction. Do, do, do these bacteria evolve even you know, quickly enough for us to see them evolving? Do they mutate into other bacteria? Or is it, is it stable? 
you know, in your research. You, you see them change? That, no, I think you should take that. Okay. That's, that's, that's um, yeah. My yeah, so the, so the bacteria do change. Everything that grows changes. Um, every time they, they double, every time they, uh, they reproduce, there's a chance for little changes to happen, random changes in their DNA. Most of them are not good. Some of them could be good. And depending on the environment they're in, they'll be selected as, oh, that, that allows you now to grow better than everybody else who was, didn't have that change. Um, when that happens, we say that's an increase in the fitness of the, of the bacteria. But that's the minority of changes. Very much a minority, but they very soon become the majority because they've got this advantage. They have a survival with the right. advantage. Right. And so we, we can see those sort of changes uh, even when we're looking at um, uh, a single species of bacterium. We can see that there, there are some uh, members of that species which are specialized for one environment and, and another that do better in, in uh, a second environment. And so they're already starting to become more specialized. And you know, theoretically, uh, someday they might only be able to grow in the one or the other environment they're in, and perhaps they'll be apart from each other long enough that they'll become a new species. Uh, so that does happen. This may teach us a lot about mutation. Oh, general. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I'm, John, I hope you're writing this down. <laughs> okay, that's Margaret McFall Nye and uh, Ned Rudy, researching at PBRC, the Pacific Bio, Bio, Bioscience Research Center. We'll be right back after this short break for more. <laughs> Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina with the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii, and one of our delights is to be partnered with Think Tech Hawaii and produce programs every week. Every Monday at 2 o'clock, we have a show called Ehana Kako, which means let's work together. So we bring people from all across the nation and the country, and certainly throughout the islands together here to talk with them about how to work together, and how to work together to do the following, to build a better economy, a better government, a better society. So if you're interested in the research of our think tank, the Gr Grassroot Institute, or if you're interested in how that's applied at the governmental and community and business levels, you'll enjoy the fascinating conversations with our guests on Ehana Kako every week on Think Tech Hawaii at 2 o'clock on Mondays. Until our next show, I'll see you. <laughs> Aloha. Okay, we're back. We're live. And we're exploring things even during the break here. Science <laughs> is ubiquitous, and it's 24 by 7. You know, these guys even talk about it at dinner at home. <laughs> now you're Boring. giving it away. <laughs> Sorry I said that. <laughs> so one question came up you know, during the break is this thing about the cilia. So you have cilia in your, in your gut, you have cilia, you know, it's, it's a surface thing. Cilia is on a surface of some kind. And it reminds me of, you know, when we were all very primitive and, um, and we were in the sea and the water, you know, went through us and all that. And so it was all, it was all surface. The gut was surface, the your skin was surface. But um, does that mean, does that mean that these bacteria we're talking about only live in those internal and external surfaces? I yeah. thought, I thought you could have bacteria all through your tissues everywhere in your body. You know? So, so one of the things that's really interesting is in those more basal groups, you know, the, the, the non-vertebrates, things without a backbone, many of them uh, have intracellular bacteria that are symbionts. It's very common uh, to have bacteria inside of their cells. And that uh, allows certain insects to live on certain, like aphids have, uh, that allow them to eat on nutrient-poor diets and the bacteria give them nutrients. Um, once you get up into the, when, once you get into the vertebrates, uh, it's very, very uncommon, if at all, do they are beneficial bacteria intracellular. Now, pathogens can be intracellular, like listeria. If you get listeriosis or um, other sorts of pathogens. Ebola. Yeah, that's a virus. Yeah, and that oh, is. Oh, sorry, yeah, that's yeah. not what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there are other but nasty bacteria. That that's Shigella. right. Shigella. Yeah, the, many, many of the pathogens, but most of the beneficial symbionts stay on the surface. But that's not to say that they don't strongly influence your biology because they uh, they release products that are taken up into your bloodstream and affect every every cell in your body that is, that is serviced by blood, uh, which is most of them, uh, is 
is influenced by the products of the bacteria in your gut. And what are the products? Are they is chemicals, oh, hormones? What is? They're it? chemicals. Um, I mean, a really good example is there's part of the bacterial cell surface that uh, is is shed, and it's taken up into your bloodstream. And it seems to there's evidence that it uh, sets the third wave of the mammalian sleep cycle. And so it's really important that you have the bacteria are involved in setting your circadian rhythms and your sleep cycles. And so that's that, I think, is a really important one. And Why can't I go down to the, 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 the vitamin store and buy some of this to uh, improve my circadian uh, rhythms? Well, in that particular case, the reason why you can't is the same reason why you can't uh, buy insulin. And that is if you take it orally, uh, it will be broken down in your stomach and never make it. Never, to never make it. Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> Brilliant, brilliant. So many mechanisms involved here. Yeah. My next question is for you, Margaret. This is clearly, this is a Margaret question. Uh -oh. <clears throat> By what mechanisms does the host recognize its specific symbiotic partners? Isn't, that's a Margaret question, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah so, so this is, this is a, a really, really big question that um, we don't have a full answer at this point. Certainly, they recognize that the bacteria are doing their job. There are certain characters of, of the, there are certain things about the bacteria that they must have in order to be successful colonists. And one, for instance, is when they're being engaged on the surface, they must have a capsule. They must have a certain um, sort of halo of, of polysaccharides around them, or they just can't, they just can't it's like colonize. Like a container. Yeah, they just can't colonize. And then you know the the light is recognized. They they have to they have to be very modal. Um, but exactly you know this conversation that goes on um, between them is something that we're we're trying to get get at. There are certain characters that that are are essential, um, and the, the the animal recognizes that. But exact the exact conversation, I would say that we're still working on that. Yes, uh, there's two ways in which you can recognize um, uh, the proper partner, if you will. Uh, one is to identify things that the partner has and, and then just go right for that partner. The other is to basically kill everybody else and whatever's left what is happens. your partner. Um, that's destructive testing. That's destructive <laughs> testing. And there, there's definitely, that is going on. Probably both of those are going on. We've, we've had more luck. Um, discovering the latter than uh, elements of the latter than the former. Uh, in other words, the, the, the host pr uh, creates this uh, uh, sort of wave of antimicrobials and uh, compounds that most bacteria cannot uh, live in the presence of, but the uh, correct symbionts, the Spibrio fischeri, can. And so basically, you're just, as Margaret said, you're winnowing away, you're getting rid of all the ones that shouldn't be able to, um, to grow there. But then there are some positive things that the, uh, that the bacterium has to do. One of them is motility. They have to be able to swim because they have to move their way uh, what is basically two or 300 body lengths uh, into the tissues to be able to, to start growing in the area that they can grow and that they're maintained for the life of the animal. And that requires uh, motility. So to, to study this, you, you really have to look at the whole molecular biology of the bacteria. Mm -hmm. You have to look into the, each bacteria. Is, is, a, is it a cell? No, it's a combination. It's bigger than a cell. It's composed it's, of cells. It's a single cell. Bacterium is a single, a single cell. cell. Single cell. Yep. Well, how each interesting. Each individual. Yeah. So if you, then you know you've you got the whole system right there. Yeah. And you can look at every little atom in that, in that cell. Mm -hmm. Wow. And, and you have equipment to do that. You can see every little atom in that cell. Yeah, we've had the genome of Vibrio fischeri yeah. for about two, uh, since 2000, since the year 2000, and and um, that's made a very, very. So we now we know all the genes that are present, and we're beginning to learn what the biochemical compounds are that that, that they're making and composed of. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, imaging is a very important aspect, and that's something Margaret's lab has has pioneered and, and used very, very effectively in the study of the symbiosis. And yeah, we can watch. One of the things that's really good about the system is it's just the right size. 
it's about the, the, the juveniles are about two millimeters long and you can put the whole darn animal underneath a microscope and watch as the animal captures the symbiont and then and then this is the symbiont real time. Move. yeah real time. Mm, real time doesn't take long it mm. takes a, it takes a couple hours is what it takes so it gives you plenty of time to watch every that's little right. move that's yeah. right yeah. you can watch the whole thing unfold and you can break it up into steps um, and that's one of the ways we understand what's going on is, is what happens in the first hour, what happens Take in the picture hour, every mm -hmm. yeah, so many minutes. Yeah. So, uh, is it, so a, a bacteria is a big cell, though. It's not a little cell, right? They're pretty small. They're a micron, so a millionth okay. of a meter. Okay. Yeah. Oh, no, they're small, then. <laughs> <laughs> so in learning about these bacteria and learning about, you know, the, the composition of the single-celled animal, which... You know, you know a lot about in terms of its effect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can can we learn about about life in general? Can we learn about curing cancer? Can we learn about the molecular processes of life? And I mean, it sounds to me, and I'm making maybe a, maybe, maybe, uh, making a huge jump here, but but it's not so much that you know every element of the DNA. It's how the genetic pieces talk to each other mm -hmm. and what happens in a combination of them right isn't that that's right yeah. and that's that's the research we haven't yet finished yeah, yeah. well and, and it and it turns out that that um, that your relationship with your bacterium is essential for every aspect of your health um, it influences everything from brain development um, and there's very now very strong evidence for involvement of your microbiome and the mother's microbiome um, in the eventual autism, in autism, the, uh, autism in children, and things like that. Um, and so, so cancer, uh, there is more and more evidence that cancer can be caused by uh, problems with your microbiome. Um, there are people uh, like Wendy Garrett back at Harvard had a beautiful review on the role of the microbiome in, in cancer. So it, it, there's, the, we're a very, very delicate ecosystem. Actually, we're pretty robust, but we're, we are an ecosystem, and that ecosystem has a certain balance. And um, one of the things that we have to be careful of is that we, particularly in the industrialized nati nations, as we've separated ourselves from living with nature, um, we're becoming less and less diverse, as we talked about earlier. And that's that can be a big problem. Everybody gets the same food off the shelf. Right. right. You know, it's troublesome. Yeah. I mean, well, a classic one is Helicobacter pylori that's supposed to cause ulcers. Actually, it uh, it is now thought to be part of your normal microbiota and an important oh. element. Yeah. So you you make a conclusion, then another conclusion. That's right. <laughs> that's right. So where is this all going to go? Where is your science going? You must think about that at the dinner table, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, where, where is it going? I mean, it's, it seems to me kind of endless here. That you know, the road just stretches out millions of miles into the future. Where, where can you take it and say this lifetime? Mm -hmm. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> it, well, this is the frontier. This is the frontier yeah. of biology. There's no question. And this, in the last 10 to 15 years, with finding <coughs> new, with, with, with this new ability to sequence, I mean, um, people like Dave Carl and Ed DeLong and whatnot at the University of Hawaii are studying the microbiome of the ocean. And it's, it's so many new things. It's just totally, it, in, many of us believe that it's going to totally revolutionize biology. And, and, so and it's the more a huge you frontier. find, the more you find you need to find other things. That's right. <laughs> it's a huge frontier. Huge and frontier. We've been talking a lot here about the, the human microbiome, and, and uh, of course there was a big effort, at the, uh, a successful effort at the, at the federal level to, to um, uh, sequence and identify the, the human microbiome, and that, that got it on everybody's lips. But in fact, that's just one tiny, tiny, tiny part of uh, the microbiomes that run the earth. Um, there are ones that are in, of course, other animals and plants besides us, uh, but there are microbiomes, as Margaret mentioned, the microbiome of, of the ocean, the microbiome of soil, the microbiome of, of even air. And each of those uh, is keeping that aspect of our biosphere uh, just as robust and just as free of, of danger as, as yeah. our microbiomes are for us. Right, and, and we hope that the public has 
uh, can develop some kind of sensitivity toward basic research because it's really, really important that we, we have at least some major portion of our, ba of our scientists doing basic research so that they can find the answers that can apply to, to human biology. Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. It makes you want to live a thousand years to find out what goes on. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Margaret. Yeah. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Jay. We had a wonderful discussion. Thank you. I, I feel like my body is talking to me more now. <laughs> 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 and, and just to, to repeat, bacteria can be your best friend.